Good morning, everyone. I'm Asha Nayaswamy. We're continuing our Sheltering with God. We're working on the way of Ananda Sanghis. So let's begin with the prayer, including the Sanghis prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all, dearest friend Swami Kriyananda. May the divine light awaken and purify our hearts and bring enlightenment to all beings. Om. Peace. Amen. One of my friends pointed out to me that this uh, prayer is very similar to the meaning of the Gayatri Mantra. Not in every respect, but it, it's, it has a similar meaning and a similar feeling to the English translations of it. He sent me five or so different translations. So it's quite possible, Swamiji. I mean, of course, it's a, it's a self-evident sentiment of universal spirituality, but it's nice. You know, that it it has a a tie-in to something more ancient. So we have our seven points of the way of Ananda Sanghi, which Swamiji wrote in 2003. And I have the whole story of how it came to be written is described in chapter 2003 here, and most of what's in this booklet. This booklet happens to be the guideline for members of the Ananda Sevaka order, which is a monastic order within the communities of Ananda. But the Sanghi is the whole song is anybody who's part of the fellowship. So there's seven points um, to the way of Ananda Sanghis, and we're in the sub subset of number two. Number two has actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. And those seven points are all to elucidate num- point number two. We believe that man's highest duty is to realize himself as an expression of all pervading Satchitanandam. And then these seven points under that are to explain to us how we do that, how we realize ourselves. So we're now up to point number D uh, on the subset. This is not really as complicated as I'm making it sound. I'm just wanting you to know because it's it's interesting that he organized it that way, that each of these is telling us. First he tells us what the goal is, to realize ourselves as Satchitanandam. Then he tells us how to do it. So it's by communion with the inner silence. performing a deliberately chosen act of service to see everyone as our brothers and sisters. That's what we've talked about so far. Now, he says, we embrace the need to give back to our Supreme Source by offering up every ego attachment and self-limiting identity in daily acts of service to others. Now, he's already said We embrace the need to embody this realization by daily performing at least one specific, conscious, personally selected act of service to our fellow beings. But here he universalizes it, makes it quite different. That is just doing something for someone every day, deliberately, uh, for the sake of Satchitananda. I'm just thinking. We had a, a wonderful man who lived here for a while, uh, Karuna McDivitt is his name. He's, he passed into the astral world a few years ago. He really loved children and had a real talent for working with them. And he, he ran an after-school program. This is before we had a school. He ran an after-school program for the children in our Sangha. And it was called uh, Say Yes to Life. And he, he got all the kids together and he, he, he commissioned them all to be secret agents for Divine Mother. And, and you know, he, they had a sort of a whole ritual, you know, about how they're into kind of like cloak and dagger. And they were commissioned that they had to do secret service, which is they had to help people, but they had to do it secretly. Because after all, they were the secret service. They weren't just the service. And then they'd come back every week and they would, you know, explain what they'd managed to do without anybody knowing that they'd done it. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And of course, the children just loved it. And it, it got them into this conscious, specific act of service chosen by me. Now, here we embrace the need to give back to our Supreme Source 
by offering up every ego attachment and self-limiting identity in daily acts of service to others. <clears throat> so it's interesting that we're giving back to God, to our Supreme Source. Swamiji uses words that are not, doesn't use the word God. I don't think he uses the word God anywhere here. He uses such an anandam, common progenitor, Supreme Source. But the way we give back is that we surrender that which has been holding us away from God. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting dynamic if you reflect upon it. Because the, the deepest understanding of God, let me put it a different way. Um, I've been doing these uh, conversations with millennials at noon every day, every weekday. And I want to give the credit to the right person. Let me think for just a moment. I think it, it was Sambhava, and I, I will apologize if I have the name incorrectly. But Sambhava talked about how he was on a spiritual search, but when he found Autobiography of a Yogi, he realized not only that the purpose of his life was to seek God, but that God was also seeking him. And that was a, a complete revelation in his way of thinking, that there was an active force that was reaching out also to him. So if we, if we can personify a, a consciousness that's really beyond personification, but the only way we can understand it is to think of it that way. Think about how much a mother or a father, mother and father is usually the best images we have, how much a mother and father gives to their child. Um, and, and I'm not sure that's actually the right image, but let's use it for a moment. You know, what does the mother or the father, what, what, make, what, what makes the mother or father rejoice when the child thrives and then the child gives back to the mother appreciation and love? The reason it stops is because there can be selfish motive in that. So I don't think the image really holds. So I'm going to try it from the point of view of wants the child to thrive. Because <clears throat> that's what God wants from us. God wants us to be happy. And the bliss of God is the bliss of seeing us fulfilled in Him. And so what holds us back from that fulfillment is that we cling to our separate and limited ego identities. And that keeps us from realizing ourselves as being such at anandam. So what God wants from us is to relinquish our separateness and to, to realize and to rejoice in the fact that we are already one with God. God is seeking us for our own happiness. <clears throat> the divine is not passive. The, the divine is not indifferent to our well-being. Uh, Yogananda, in one of his letters, might be, might be the poem, When I Am Only a Dream. It's in one of his poems. <clears throat> But he talks about how he will continue to guide us and to guide us from inside. And when we make an error and as a consequence suffer for our error, he says he will weep for us. He will weep through his own eyes and then, as he said, he will weep, weep through our eyes. That he is within us and our suffering is his suffering. So the way we, way we give to God is to fulfill our own destiny. And to fulfill our own destiny means to relinquish our insistence on being separate. And there's, there's a number, a genre of movies, which is it's not my favorite genre because it's always so hysterical, which is some kind of a war movie that takes place in a submarine. You know, because a submarine is very claustrophobic and it's very small, and so the camera angles are always little and people are always pushing here and there. And inevitably, the drama of the war movie about a submarine is when there's a puncture and the water comes rushing in. And that, of course, creates this hysteria because <clears throat> the submarine is at the bottom of the sea and the <clears throat> tremendous force of the ocean breaks through at one small point and then the whole submarine is going to be ripped to pieces. And to my mind, that's always actually been an image in the reverse which is that we create for ourselves this ego structure. And just like that submarine has to be so strong in order to hold back 
the force of the ocean, which is always trying to break through like this. So we have to work so hard with so much tension to keep our ego self in place against the pressure of Satchitananda, against the pressure of our own higher reality. And any place that we can crack <clears throat> that the seamlessness of that ego structure, then the divine love will just simply rush in. So as the sub-point here of how we realize ourselves as Satchitananda, <coughs> is that we consciously offer back to the source all our ego definitions and all, all limiting self-definitions that we have. And not just sort of let it happen accidentally, but deliberately. And now these acts of service are to consciously say, I'm not just living for myself, I'm living for the good of all. And that's why it says we offer it back to the source by acts of daily service to others. We say, I'm tired, I really just want to take a nap, but instead I think I'll cook some food for someone else who needs it. I only have a limited amount of money and I want to spend it on myself, but so-and-so also needs it. And then we do it consciously, not so much for the sake of the other person, but for the sake of constantly affirming within ourselves, Divine Mother, I'm doing this for you. Now this point comes after the one just before this, which I spoke about yesterday. We're all brothers and sisters in God. We are all, we are all the one consciousness. So we also look at the one we're serving and realize I'm not offering it to you. I'm offering it to the divine within you. That's what I'm serving. I'm sacrificing my self-protective self-definition in a conscious awareness Then I'm giving this to God. Swami Kriyananda, when he tells a story, and maybe it's in the path, it's in a book somewhere, of meeting this man who, he picked him up as a hitchhiker, and he could see that the man was a little bit down on his luck. And uh, so the guy gave him, gave Swamiji a sort of hard luck story, and he obviously wanted some money. And Swamiji had very little money of his own at that time, but he said, I have this much money and I'll give you half of it. So it was $20 or something like that. It wasn't a large sum. And the man said, um, you know, I'll be sure and pay you back. He said, because I wouldn't want you to lose your faith in human nature. And Swami was pretty sure he would never see the money again. But he said to the man, he said, oh, I lost my faith in human nature a long time ago. He said, I'm not giving this to you. I'm giving it to God in you. And I trust that God will take care of me if I take care of him in all these forms. And so we're surrendering this idea that I have to always be surrounded by my own self-identity and protect that. And this is how we realize Satchitanandam within ourselves. This becomes an, a, an everyday practice. Every time we have the opportunity to give, we try to take that opportunity. You know, over the course of many years, I, I try to watch this because there's so many opportunities to give. One could just, you know, take one's paycheck and just pour it out, you know, the next morning and have nothing left to pay your rent. So you have to sort of walk. We have to be practical in our idealism. We can't be presumptuous and, and imagine ourselves to be more um, surrendered than we actually are, to presume on God's grace when we haven't actually lifted ourselves up to the level where that faith is more than affirmation. But one gets a sort of feeling about these things. You, you get a feeling of, this is what I'm supposed to give to. And you, when you begin to practice that, it just becomes, it becomes apparent to you that this is what I'm supposed to give. Um, a man who, in our community who was very relatively well-to-do and gave very generously to support our sangha, he said whenever he would get a request, he would, always feel, he would always feel inside whether or not this request was really for him. And if he felt that it was for him, he would always feel that there was a certain dollar amount that he ought to give. And sometimes that dollar amount, he said, was bigger than he would have chosen for himself, as he put it. But when it came to him that way, he knew it. I had this interestingly when I, was, when I have traveled in India, which I have a fair amount, especially when we were on our pilgrimages, which I did for a dozen times or so. 
because we would be walking through the streets of many Indian cities, and especially we started in 1986. In those years, all of India was more impoverished, and it was it was just a more confusing situation. Excuse me, my microphone keeps pulling in a way that's uncomfortable. And you would be often surrounded by beggars and just really wouldn't quite know what to do. But it was so interesting to me. I would pass, you know, two dozen beggars and just not feel, I I would bless them. I, I had a prayer, which was, Divine Mother, bless us all. So it wasn't unsympathetic. But then every so often I'd see someone and I knew I was supposed to give money to them. And it's just, and I would. You know, I kept small money in my pocket because you don't really like to pull out your whole purse and open your wallet in situations like that. But I would just have it. And I I felt perfectly at ease. This This one is for me to give. This one is mine. And once you start beginning to think about serving God in others and make and make your offering an offering to God, it's extremely interesting how it comes back to as to what we're supposed to do. So Anyway, that was the thought. Just we're in this COVID nineteen thing here, still in lockdown. And about six or eight weeks ago, when we were really, whenever we were just beginning, um, a friend of mine started making cloth masks that would help, um, you know, help protect people. And and I know how to sew, and I have everything I need here to do that. And I was just, you know, sort of helping her to distribute them and so on like that. And then I just woke up one morning and it was like, this. you're supposed to be doing this. Why are you just helping her? So I just got up and spent actually many weeks making, in the end, several hundred of the masks for our community and for our sangha and so on. But it was very interesting. It wasn't, I didn't feel any connection to it. And then Divine Mother said, no, you're supposed to do this. This is your service. Then I carried it out. And more recently, I haven't stopped completely. But it was like, okay, it's enough. You've done, you've done what you need to do. You're finished with this now. And when you start practicing, you'll, find, you'll feel very comfortable. You'll feel very comfortable saying yes and also saying no. Because it's not other people you're serving. It's giving back your ego identity to God by offering yourself, extending your self-identity out to include the God in others. You see, that's what you're doing. You're redefining yourself redefining myself to include your welfare, this project, these people's needs. And so it isn't like you're doing something for someone else. It's that you're doing it for yourself. It's, it's for God that you're doing it. God in me serves the God in you. Master had this beautiful saying we often quote when he was, um, toward the end of his life, he took a lot of his disciples' karma in his body and a lot of it came into his knees, and there were times when he couldn't walk. And he lived on the second or third floor of the building there, and so the monks would often carry him upstairs. And uh, he, when, he, when he, some of the monks were carrying him, and Swami was in the group carrying him upstairs, um, Master said, you're so kind to me with all your attentions, the way you're taking care of me, he said to the disciples. They said, oh, sir, It's you who are kind to us. And then Master said, God serving God. He said, that's what pleases him. And so that's how we should think. This is, again, we surrender the ego self. It's not I who am doing this. It's the divine in me sees the divine in you and reaches out as God would. And in that way, our service becomes ego transcendence. Because if the ego is merely generous and knows itself to be generous and is proud of itself for being generous, you might do a little bit of good for other people, but you don't yourself foster your realization. So that's what Swami's trying to say here. It's not enough to be generous and then to be proud of yourself. You have to feel it as God serving God so that there's no one here who's actually doing it. It's just the energy comes and the energy goes whether that's physical energy, um, spiritual support, uh, financial energy, lifting boxes when somebody needs the boxes lifted. It's God serving God. That's what pleases him. That's his play. Now the next point is, we seek as our primary goal in life the state of actual 
conscious union with Satchitananda. So this is also, and it follows very naturally from the point before, actual conscious union with Satchitananda. What Swamiji is also saying here is that the way of an Ananda Sangha is not dogmatic. It's not that this is the beliefs and therefore I will believe them. It's not like we recite this every morning and then because we say I believe in this and I believe in that, that somehow that is the measurement of our um, compliance with these instructions of Swami. It needs to be an actual conscious experience. It's in the here and now. There's no after I die, I'll go to heaven. One of my friends, I love this. He's, he, he grew up to be a very creative, extremely unorthodox fellow. When he was young, his parents sent him to Catholic school. He didn't much care for school anyway, and he didn't particularly enjoy where he was. And he had one of those classic unfortunate classic sort of nuns as a teacher. I mean, many nuns are wonderful souls, but there's a classic image of the the nun school teacher, and he had one. And he was a, a feisty little boy and was often not doing what he was supposed to. And she tried to persuade him to be good by telling him that if he was good, when he died, he would have a bigger house in heaven. This is the nun trying to persuade a six-year-old to behave. And he said... He was so delighted to hear that because he didn't have the slightest interest in having a bigger house in heaven, and he felt, therefore, he was absolved from having to be a good boy. (laughs) He felt totally freed up to express himself however he expressed himself. I mean, it totally backfired in terms of the nun's intention with that. But there are, you know, lots of spiritual teachings, especially from Kali Yuga, less so now as we're in Dwapara, where there's no... There's no proof in this lifetime. In this lifetime, it's just belief. I just put myself on the right side of the ledger and then I'm safe. I, I rarely, I, I hardly knew my grandparents because both sets of grandparents lived on the East Coast and I lived on the West Coast. And the families were not that close. I mean, my, my parents were uh, obedient and kind to their parents, but it wasn't a very tight-knit family. But I remember visiting my grandfather when I was small enough to sit on his lap. So I must have been about seven or eight. And he was Jewish, and he went to this, he lived in Key West. They lived in Key West, Florida, which was quite different than now. I understand it's quite an upscale resort area. But when my mother lived there, it was just this tiny town at the very end of the Keys in Florida. And there was a small Jewish synagogue there, which my father attended. And you know, this is like, I didn't have much religious training, but I remember sitting on my grandfather's lap and saying, do you really believe in all of this? <laughs> and the only answer he gave me, which was quite sincere, but ridiculous in retrospect, he said, well, he said, I won't know for sure until I die. And if I'm wrong, I won't know it. And if I'm right, I'll be glad. <laughs> and it stayed in my little child's brain. But it was like, really? That's what your whole religion is about. It's just like hedging your bet against when you die. Now, I think my grandfather was just talking to me as a child because I think he had a. I think he had an actual feeling for Judaism, but he wasn't, to my observation, a deeply spiritual person in any way. But that is what a lot of people think of: that somehow, in some later stage, this will be proven to me. But Swami is saying, no. What we want is an actual conscious. Um, a, a feeling, um, a state of actual conscious union with Satchitananda. That's the way of the Ananda Sangha. We're not uh, doing this just because it seems like a good idea. We're doing it because we're conducting an experiment, and that experiment is proving itself. I mean, Swami's not talking here about the whole plethora of the culture of self realization of all the things that we can do. But if we, if we have this inner communion, this daily inner communion in the silence, if we consciously devote ourselves to serving others, if we recognize God as present and see our union with all other beings, our, having our common progenitor, which I love the word, if we deliberately and resolutely and continually uh, surrender our limited ego identity to the divine, then our actual consciousness will change. And we will actually walk through this world 
with a very different feeling about it than many people have. You know, after being on the spiritual path and living in community, which I've been fortunate to do essentially my entire adult life, sometimes you see people do things and you just think, how, how can they behave like that? It's just not in us to do it. There was a funny story from a, a little girl who grew up in the Ananda community in the 70s at the, at the Nanda village, which was all we had at that time. And we were, we were pretty isolated out there. Um, and, you know, just once a week or so or once every other week, people would drive into town. We didn't even have a master's market then, so you had to go to town to get groceries. We had neither washing machines nor markets. So every week or so, you had to go into town to buy food and to do laundry. And But the little girl, her life, she was about five at this point, most of her life was within the community with these really harmonious, refined, high consciousness people. And they were at the laundromat, and there was some mother there who became quite impatient and started treating her child very roughly. She wasn't abusing him, but she was yelling at him and sort of dragging him. And the little girl looked at her mother and said, Mommy, why is that mommy behaving so badly? Just She just couldn't understand. Mommies don't behave like that. Because that was how she was raised, and she was never treated that way, and she never saw it. You see, and that's how we become. Why are you behaving like that? But you, you don't see it as judgment. You just feel it as compassion. Oh my, oh dear, look what's going on here. We had a, 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 a 12 years of litigation against Ananda, this complicated thing which is all described in Light Bearer. I don't have to describe it here. And at the very end, this grown woman um, accused Ananda of being a, well, a morally reprehensible cult in which every possible kind of abuse, starting with sexual and financial and power, and just everything you could imagine. She made up a story, but she had a good lawyer and we did not have a good lawyer. So in the end, she actually got money from us uh, because of this uh, complete fabrication that she'd created. Part of the problem for us was that the thing was so preposterous, I have to say this seriously, we never thought it could gain traction. We thought it would just take five minutes to just prove that it was just absurd. <clears throat> but we <clears throat> underestimated what can happen when you have a dishonorable lawyer, which she had, and you have a judge who plays to the dishonorable lawyer. We didn't know any of this. We had two lawsuits, and in the first lawsuit, we had a fabulous judge. And even though we weren't fond of the other side's attorneys, they were, they were honest. This side, we had a not very good judge, and we had a very dishonorable lawyer. And we just didn't know what can happen. So in the end, we were declared morally reprehensible, collectively and individually. And uh, she collected money from us, not as much as she hoped, but some more than we wanted to give her. But here's what was so interesting to me. This, after that trial, which I don't know how long it took, a number of weeks, we all finally come back into the courtroom for the final verdict. And we're all sitting there, and this plaintiff lady is over here. And all of a sudden, it comes out that she's won. She's won the judgment. And I was so, I have to, the word I can use is I was so pleased with myself. Because the first thought I had was tremendous compassion for her. <gasps> oh my gosh, I thought, not only has she turned against the source of her spiritual inspiration, not only has she, um, you know, scandalously lied about, about people from whom she has received spiritual initiation, but she's won. And now it will reinforce the delusion in her mind that she did the right thing. And so the karma will intensify, and the, the effort that it's going to take to, to straighten out that karma will be even worse. At least if she had lost, it would have stopped at that point. But I thought, thank you, God. I, I was just very grateful, and I still feel that way. It's just there's no, need, there's no need on my part to have any opinion about what she did or anything like that. Why would I? It would just spoil my own sense of peace. God will take care of her poor thing. And that's how we begin to feel, you see. We're all brothers and sisters. And when you see your brother or your sister doing something that's injurious, well, if we're still clinging to our self-definitions and they're 
their actions cause me pain, then we want to go like this. But if we have systematically practiced relinquishing our ego identity, then we can have a conscious, actual experience of, of the presence of Satchitanandam in us. And then when we look out the world, that's all we see. You know, I, I repeat that incident with the trial because it was notable for me. I'm by no means always able to go there. But the fact that in such a circumstance I was, was I felt it was a very sweet gift from God to remind me that this, these teachings are not a belief. These teachings are an actual exper- experience, and this is the experiment we need to conduct. God bless you.